All right. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is BJ Edwards, and I serve as the executive director of the Wyoming Food Coalition. Our organization is a statewide nonprofit working to strengthen local food systems by connecting stakeholders and amplifying their voices so that Wyoming producers, consumers, and environments thrive. Our members work to address challenges in Wyoming's food systems at every point with an emphasis on connecting Wyomingites with local food. If you have any questions during the presentation, please add them in the chat, preferably with three question marks at the beginning so we can more easily find them. We'll address as many as possible with respect to everyone's time. We'll begin the program shortly, but before we do, please note we will be recording this session if you do not want your picture available on the recording, please feel free to turn off your video. If you, during the introduction portion of this session, if you don't want to unmute or turn your video on, feel free to put an introduction in the chat and I can read that for you because our speaker is going to ask for an audience introduction shortly. This uh, speaker series recording will be uploaded to YouTube next week and will be available for viewing along with all of our other past speaker series and conference recordings on the Wyoming Food Coalition YouTube channel anytime. If you wish to sign up for our email list or for our next speaker session at the end of next month, or if you want to watch any of the other recordings in our monthly series, please see the links I will include in the chat shortly. I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Stephanie Stivar. Did I say that right, Stephanie? You did. Okay, perfect. Of Consumer Health under the Wyoming Department of Agriculture. Stephanie is an area supervisor for the Wyoming Department of Ag, Consumer Health Services. She has been with the department for the past 18 years. Stephanie helps oversee the manufactured food program and the egg grading program. Other areas worked include retail food, state meat program, and pools and spas. Stephanie resides in Campbell County with her family and spends her free time raising livestock and supporting her children in their many activities, so she fits in quite well with this group. Tonight, we will learn about the regulations overseen by the Wyoming Department of Agriculture required to sell food in our state. Please welcome Stephanie. Thank you very much, BJ. Um, so as BJ mentioned, I do like to, when I give this presentation, ask everyone to kind of give a little bit of an introduction. Um, so what I'm going to go over today is just the rules that any time that you're selling, and it's really geared toward the farmer's market in Wyoming. Um, and so this is, is just a, a basic overview of any of the rules that need to be followed in order to sell food at the farmer's market or, or anywhere within Wyoming. Um, so I generally like to pull my audience and just see um, for those in the room, what are you selling or what do you plan on selling? So what is your interest um, in this presentation this evening? So if someone wants to put that information in the chat or if you want to come off of speaker, um, I would like to see have each one of you answer in some form. I'll go first since I'm already here. Um, my name's BJ. I have Taste of the Wind in Laramie, and I sell lamb, beef, and pork. Okay. I'll go ahead and read the ones that are popping up in the chat. Um, Callie Swanbaum of Short Grass Livestock in Burns, Wyoming. She sells beef direct to consumer in South, at Southeast Wyoming. Leroy, I'm going to throw you under the bus for a second. Do you want to go next? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, my late wife and I planted about three quarters of an acre of raspberries, blackberries, and this year, pine weed and kochia. But uh, so we used to sell farmer's market, but now I just sell the fresh berries, uh, elderberry and stuff like that. Jamie, do you want to go next? Oh, I see Jamie's in the chat. I'll read hers off. Jamie is in Powell, and she gets questions from locals frequently regarding chicken meat and home-baked goods. So she's here to learn more about those items. Okay. Cindy, did you want to go ahead next? 
Sure. I'm a bit of an odd duck here, I think, with the group, but uh, I'm Cindy and I'm in Laramie. Um, <clears throat> I moved to Laramie four years ago um, and I worked for a different Department of Agriculture, working with manufactured foods, um, produce and maple syrup in both the marketing and regulatory areas, um, doing a lot of producer education, producer planning. Um, and my family had a um, FDA approved commercial kitchen for jams, jellies, pickles, and relish. Um, I also worked a lot on the initial legislation and farmer's market guide. Um, so I'm really interested in seeing how Wyoming has developed. I think that you are a little more progressive and also um, think about maybe down the line, um, revisiting our commercial food production and company um, on a smaller scale. So just trying to figure out where the differences are and similarities. So, and I still work, I do some consulting back east with the maple syrup producers and some manufactured food companies. So just here to listen. Awesome, glad to have you in Wyoming, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for sharing. That does give me a better idea of the audience that I'm that I'm presenting to, and I do appreciate you sharing a little bit about your reason why you're here. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and just get started with the presentation. Um, if I can get it to advance here. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking specifically about those types of establishments or producers that would be selling food primarily at the Wyoming farmers markets. Um, so the different types of establishments that I'll be be discussing today is a temporary food establishment, um, what we consider a temporary food sampling establishment, um, the regular licensed food establishment, a raw ag producer, and a food freedom producer. And so I'm going to touch on each one of these areas and kind of give you an overview of what the, the requirements are for each one of these specific areas. Um, if you have any questions, as BJ mentioned, make sure to put them in the chat. I would love to answer any questions that you have today or tonight. And if I can't give you an answer tonight, I will definitely get that information back to BJ. So please make sure that you do get those questions in. Um, so the first one I'm going to give you a little bit of information about is a temporary food establishment. Um, for those of you in Wyoming, you may have heard of this. Um, temporary food establishment is any establishment that isn't your brick and mortar type um, facility that doesn't operate on a continual basis. So they don't require a um, regular establishment license. Um, so, but a temporary food establishment is anything that would be selling food, primarily prepared on site. Um, so this is this type of establishment does require a license. Um, the cost of that license is $50. Um, that license is valid for one specific event at one location for up to 14 consecutive days. Um, so if, say, a farmer's market was had someone coming to sell burgers on a regular basis, um, they could go for that one specific farmer's market. They could get a temporary permit that would work for 14 consecutive days. And then after that 14 consecutive days, then they would have to get another temporary permit. All of those foods must be prepared on site or in a licensed kitchen, and they must meet the um, temporary food stand requirements, which are available on our website. So if you're curious as to what those might be, um, check out the Wyoming Department of Agriculture website and you'll be able to see what the temporary food stand requirements are. Um, this, if this is a, a license that you would ever need, make sure that you contact your local inspector and they can get this for you. It's a relatively easy process. Um, it doesn't take very long and they can get you, get you taken care of in, in a short period of time. So the second type of establishment that I want to visit about is more geared toward the, the farmer's market. And it actually was, was made, was, designed with the farmer's market in mind for those people who are giving samples. Um, so this is the, the temporary food sampling establishment. So this also requires a license. So you are required to contact your local inspector and get that license. It also costs $50. Um, but this license, instead of being valid for 14 consecutive days, um, as I mentioned, it's, it, it was designed with the farmer's market in mind, and it is valid for one specific event, so one farmer's market in one location, from no more than 14 individual days within a three-month period, within a three-month consecutive period. 
So um, like I said, this was designed with a farmer's market in mind so that an individual could essentially start in June um, with the farmer's market or start in, you know, if, if we're talking produce that they're that they're bringing in, start in August and they could make it through August, September and October on the same permit with the, and have 14 consecutive days within that time frame. Um, this is specifically only for people who are giving out free samples. So if they're charging for the food at all, they can they're not eligible for a temporary food sampling permit. So this is only for people who are giving out free samples. Um, and generally, we see this used by someone like a raw agricultural producer who has their product, say they have their, you know, tomatoes that they're bringing in, they want to slice up the tomatoes, and then they can go ahead and slice the tomatoes and then hand out is hand out parts of the tomato instead of handing out whole tomatoes. Now, if a raw egg producer wanted to go ahead and give out whole samples, so they want to give out a whole tomato, a whole carrot, something like that, it doesn't require. It's only if they're in some way, shape, or form um, cutting that product up to give smaller samples. If they're doing it on a whole basis, it doesn't require a license. Um, this also, if an individual gets this, like I said, just get a hold of your local inspector and they can get this for you in a in relatively short amount of time. Um, and it must meet the temporary food stand requirements that I visited about with a temporary food stand. Okay, so the next type of license is the licensed food establishment that most of us think about whenever we think about, about a food establishment. So this is the brick and mortar building or the mobile unit that you see all over, all over town. Um, they're becoming more and more popular. But this establishment holds a, a year-long license. Um, they carry the Wyoming food license. Their initial cost is $200 and then $100 for each subsequent year. Um, this facility does have to meet the requirements of the Wyoming food license as outlined in the Wyoming food safety rule. And they, like I said, it can either be a brick and mortar building or it can be a mobile. They, it also works for the manufacturers who are using a commissary. So we have quite a few of the manufacturers who don't themselves have the brick and mortar building, but they're using a commissary. And so this is also the type of license that they would need to have um, for our licensed establishments. Um, all of these foods are prepared in a licensed kitchen. Um, and if a facility is preparing anything outside of that licensed kitchen, they would also require the temporary food food temporary food stand license. Um, so this one requires an individual to go and, and do a plan review packet prior to licensing. They have to go through a pre-opening inspection. And then at that point in time, they actually apply for their license. So the next type of, of producer or facility that we have or establishment that we have is a raw ag producer. And listening to most of your whys that you're on this presentation, um, most of you had in some way, way, shape, or form are raw ag producers. So Wyoming Statute 35.7.124 ex exempts a raw ag producer from obtaining a Wyoming food license for the processing, distribution, storage, or sale of any raw agricultural commodity they produce. Um, so this is any of the um, vegetables that are produced in Wyoming, any of the raw meat that is produced in Wyoming. Um, those are all raw ag commodities. So a raw ag commodity is a food that's sold in its raw natural form, including the fruits and vegetables that are washed or colored or otherwise treated, but unpeeled in their natural form prior to marketing. Um, so the raw agricultural producer exemption is limited for the sale of raw ag products within the state of Wyoming. So if someone is selling outside of the state, they would then have to talk to whatever state they're selling in to determine what their laws are. But this only exempts ag producers within the state of Wyoming. So they are exempt from the licensing requirement, but they are not exempt from the inspection requirement. So a raw ag producer in Wyoming doesn't have to pay the $200 or $100 fee for the license, but they do then have to be inspected. So they would have still have to get a hold of their local inspector, do the, the plan review packet, go through the pre-opening inspection, and then they would be inspected at least once a year. Um, most of our raw agricultural producers are inspected just once a year. So um, it's based on risk. And so um, most of them fall into that, that low risk category. Um, 
The raw meats have to be, so if anyone is doing raw meats as their raw agricultural commodity, they do have to be processed in a, either a state inspected or a, or a federally inspected meat processing plant. Um, any producer that is selling jerky, snack sticks, or any other cooked project, product, um, salami, anything like that, they would have to then obtain a food license. This is only specifically for raw meats um, or raw produce. So the raw produce, as I mentioned, cannot be processed. It can only be harvested um, and has to remain in its raw form. And then, as I mentioned, with the temporary sampling establishment, if one of the, the raw ag producers did choose to then um, give out samples, if they're not giving them out in their whole form, then they would have to obtain a temporary sampling establishment license through the Wyoming Department of Agriculture. Okay. Um, since we're talking about raw agricultural producers, um, one of the main areas that we see the raw agricultural producer exemption used is with raw meat. And so I did just want to touch a little bit on the differences between, um, because in the state of Wyoming, we have three different types of processors. We have a custom processor, we have a state inspected processor, and a USDA inspected meat plant. Um, so I wanted to, all of those are the ones that process domestic domestic livestock. And so I did want to, pro, want to just touch on the differences between a custom processor, a state inspected processor, and a federally inspected plant. Um, so a custom processor is um, those facilities which an individual takes in their own livestock, they plan to get their own livestock back, and then they themselves will eat it that anything that's taken to a custom processor cannot be sold. So most of the time when you get the meat back from, or all of the time when you get the meat back from a custom processor, that meat is actually going to have a label on it that says not for sale. Um, so that's just stating that whatever is brought into that facility and goes out of that facility does have to be not for sale. So it can't be sold after it's been slaughtered. Um, the one caveat to this is that if a if a person or an individual or a ranch or someone is selling an animal on the hoof, so they're selling that animal prior to slaughter be while it's still alive, or even parts of that animal prior to slaughter while it's still alive, they can go ahead and do that on the hoof, and then they can take it to a custom processor. At that point in time, when they take it to the custom processor, they let them know who's purchased the animal, and it goes to exactly who purchased the animal. Um, that is the one the one caveat as far as how that can be sold if you're taking it to a custom processor. A state inspected processing plant <clears throat> is inspected by Wyoming state inspectors. So it's inspected every day that they process, and we are the inspector is there from the time that they start to the finish on any slaughter day. That product that's taken to a state inspected processing plant can either go back to the individual who owns the animal or it can be sold throughout the state of Wyoming. Um, the other plant that I mentioned was a USDA processing plant. So anything that is taken to a USDA processing plant also can go back to the individual or it can be sold across state lines. So that's the difference in those plants. Um, this slide also mentions a wild game plant. We do have wild game plants within the state of Wyoming, both licensed and unlicensed. If that plant is only processing wild game for the individuals who bring it in, then they can go ahead and do that without being licensed. If a facility is donating product, say to a shelter, to a food bank, something like that, then that product needs to be in, needs needs to be processed in an inspected plant or a licensed plant. So, just to kind of give you an idea, and if we have any questions based on on how meat can be sold in Wyoming, we'll definitely go over those at the end of the presentation. The last type of of product or producer that we have is the food freedom products. Um, this is probably what we get the most questions about. Um, so Wyoming statute 1149, 101 through 104 is the Wyoming Food Freedom Act. Um, any of the foods that are sold through the Wyoming Food Freedom Act must be made in the home. So they can't be made in a commissary kitchen and then sold as a food freedom product. They do have to be made in the home. Um, the transactions for any of those products have to be through the producer and the end consumer, except as it's otherwise stated in the act. So a producer may utilize a designated agent for specific transactions. Um, the seller of eggs, dairy products, homemade food products that are non-potentially hazardous by the definition of the Wyoming Food Freedom Act may either be the producer of the item, a designated agent of the producer, 
or a third party vendor, including a retail shop or a grocery store, as long as the products are in compliance with the act. And we'll talk more as I as I go through this about what compliance with the act looks like. Um, the seller of a homemade food that consists of potentially hazardous food, um, except for the eggs and dairy, because they're mentioned in the previous sentence, shall be either the producer of the item or a designated agent of that item. So it's not able to be sold in a retail shop or grocery store. So just the producer, the designated agent, or the producer. Um, any of the food freedom product sales must occur only in Wyoming. They cannot go into interstate commerce. Um, the sales can occur at farmers markets, farms, ranches, um, producers' homes, offices, retail locations if they're non-potentially hazardous food, or they can um, occur at any location that their producer and the informed end consumer agree on. Um, with the exception of the raw unprocessed fruits and vegetables that we talked about earlier that, are, that fall under the raw ag exemption, um, foods that are under the Food Freedom Act may not be sold or used in any commercial establishment. Um, so any homemade or uninspected food cannot be utilized by any licensed facility. Um, the producer has to inform the end consumer that the products that are being sold um, through the farmer's market, the ranch, the roadside stand, however they're being sold, are not regulated or inspected. Um, and if they're doing them, do, using a third party for non-potentially hazardous foods, um, they, they also must make sure that the end consumer knows that the homemade product is not certified, labeled, licensed, packaged, regulated, or inspected. Um, for sales of non-potentially hazardous foods in a retail location, they do have to be displayed on a specific shelf. They can't be commingled with inspected product, and they do have to be prominently labeled with the statement, this food is made in a home kitchen and is not regulated or inspected and may contain allergens. Um, the sales of meat um, is always a question that we get regarding the Food Freedom Act. So in regards to the Food Freedom Act, meat products may not be sold under the Food Freedom Freedom product with the following exceptions. So um, this is where it gets a little bit difficult to understand, um, but we'll, if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those. So the sale of poultry and poultry products can be done if the producer who raises those poultry products um, does not slaughter more than a thousand birds of their own raising during one calendar year. Um, they do have to keep records on that and keep records of how many birds that they have raised and slaughtered. Um, they cannot engage in buying and selling of poultry products. They have to, the poultry products that they're using within the food freedom products do have to be from their own raising and they must not be adulterated or misbranded in any way. Um, another exception to this is that they we do allow for the sale of live animals. Um, that has been the case as long as I can remember, um, and and that will that will continue. So live animals, as I mentioned before, can be sold on the hoof before they are slaughtered at any to any. You can do it in portions. You can do it in whole animals. However, you want to do that, they can be sold um, sold on the hoof. Um, as I mentioned, the portions of live animals may also be sold for slaughter. And then domestic, the sale of domestic rabbit is allowed to be done under the Food Freedom Act and the sale of farm-raised fish, provided that those fish have been raised in accordance with Title 23 of Wyoming statutes, which is a Wyoming fish and game statute. Um, the fish may not be catfish. Catfish are considered an amenable species by the USDA, and so therefore they do have to, um, they are, are not allowed to be sold under the Food Freedom Act. And then the other exemption or the other, the other way that meat can be sold is pursuant with the animal shares under the Wyoming statute 1149-104, which is the last section of the Food Freedom Act. Um, so an animal share means an ownership interest in an animal or herd of animals created by a written contract between informed, the informed end consumer and the farmer or rancher that includes a bill of sale to the consumer for an ownership interest of an animal or herd and a boarding provision under which the consumer boards the animal with the farmer or rancher for care and processing and the consumer is entitled to receive the share of meat from that animal or herd. So, 
I wanted to read that just so that I could, there's a lot of different portions of what has to happen with an animal share. And so I wanted to read that just so that I was stating exactly how that is written in the, in the Wyoming Food Freedom Act. So as it mentions, the animal share must have a written contract between the informed and consumer and the farmer or rancher, has to include a bill of sale, showing the ownership interest of the animal, um, and it has to have information on the boarding provisions for how that animal will be cared for. Um, so as far as animal shares are concerned, um, the meat does, the, the meat with the animal share, it does specifically have to be received from a specific animal or herd on the ranch. Um, that has to be stated in advance. It has to be received on or behalf of the owner of the animal share, has to be obtained from a particular animal or herd, and the owner, um, the prominent warning of the meat has to be labeled had, that it has not been inspected or derived um, from an inspect inspected animal and, in, excuse me, delivered to an informed end consumer um, and the, the this has to, or the displayed on the label affixed to the meat packaging. So it does have to have the warning statement that it is not inspected. Um, information describing the standards used by the farm and ranch with respect to the herd um, does have to be included with the animal shares. And no person may sell, donate, or commercially redistribute the meat from an animal share. Um, and no farmer or rancher is allowed to publish a statement saying that the Department of Agriculture's approval or endorsement of the meat um, from that animal share has been made. Any meat product that is part of an animal share does have to be processed in a licensed meat facility. So either the custom plant, the state plant, or the, the federally inspected plant. Okay, um, so that's a, a quick version of what the specific requirements are to sell products in the state of Wyoming. Um, like I said, this is primarily focused on the farmer's market regulations or the farmer's market area. Um, I've seen a few questions pop up in the chat. So um, BJ, if you want to go through there, I'll go ahead and answer those. Or if anyone wants to come off mute, I can go ahead and answer those questions as well. I'll get started on reading through these. I tend to hog the chat on these. <laughs> so if anyone else wants to go ahead of my questions, go ahead and slip those in and I'll bump those up to the top. All right. Um, so Jamie asked a question, um, but made an edit to it and said she thought that you may have answered it um, so if that's the case, then let us know. But uh, she overheard at a farmer's market uh, that had her questioning what was legal in this situation. She said someone stated that it wasn't legal to sell soup or casserole or any meal of that sort at a farmer's market that included store-bought meat. And so that is correct. Um, as I mentioned, meat specifically cannot be sold under the Food Freedom Act, with the exception of the poultry products. And those poultry products cannot be store-bought. They have to be raised by the individual who is making that casserole or soup or whatever it is. So, And they have to fall under the 1,000 bird exemption, which means that that individual processes less than 1,000 birds throughout one calendar year of their specific raising. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, are the temporary food prep and sampling food licenses applicable to food covered in the Food Freedom Act, or are those foods exempt from those licenses? So they are not applicable to food freedom products um, because of the fact that the Food Freedom Act specifically states that the, the food cannot be licensed or inspected they do not fall under those same requirements. Those would be specifically, um, as far as the temporary food permit, that is specifically for any food that is prepared on site or someone goes into a licensed kitchen and then brings on site. 
Um, the sampling permit itself is for food that is being given away free um, by the vendors. And so if they're doing that, then that requires the sampling permit. I've had a lot of people ask, uh, because I'm involved with the Food Coalition, what the difference is between the Wyoming Food Safety Rule, the Wyoming Food Rule, and the Wyoming Food Freedom Act. I'm not sure if all those three things are actually in existence, but I'm curious if you could give us a brief overview. The Wyoming Food Safety Rule and the Wyoming Food Rule are the exact same thing. So they're referred to both ways. Um, it's uh, the official name is the Wyoming Food Safety Rule, but many people drop off the safety and just call it the Wyoming Food Rule. Um, so what that is, is it's a set of rules promulgated by the Wyoming Department of Agriculture, um, given their authority within Wyoming statutes. So the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is actually the statute that gives Wyoming Department of Agriculture um, the jurisdiction and, and the, gives us the authority to do any of our inspections and licensing. And so that is the set of rules that's promulgated through that statute. The Food Freedom Act is a separate statute that then allows for the home producer to then produce those foods in their home and sell them to the end consumer. Thank you. Yeah. Does produce that has been washed but not cut after harvest still count as a raw product? It does. Um, as long as there is no processing step taking care of taking place. So you can go ahead and harvest it, wash it, and package it for sanitary conveyance, but absolutely no processing may take place. How is domestic game handled that is hunted on private land in a paid outfitter situation? Is that considered wild game meat or domestic meat? And then how does it have to be processed? Okay, this is, the, this is that's a question I don't get often. Um, any, I'm trying to think of how, okay, repeat that question for me. How is domestic game handled that is hunted on private land in a paid outfitter situation? Is that considered wild game meat or domestic meat? And how does it have to be processed? So on an outfitter situation, that meat would be going back to the individual who harvested that animal. And so therefore, I think it would still, I, I am not 100% sure on this one. Um, it's a question I may have to get back to you to get the, to make sure that I'm absolutely right on it. But I believe that it would still fall, fall under wild game and it would still fall under the game and fish. And so it would still fall under their regulations. And therefore, if you were donating it, would still have to go through a licensed facility. If you were taking it home, you could take it to any type of facility. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I will check it and make sure that I'm right on that, but I'm I'm pretty sure that I am. I think Steph, well, that was... this is Ashley. Yep. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, Ashley Stegman. I'm uh, work with with Stephanie, and I would say I concur with what you were saying in regards to the outfitters. Uh, typically, that is a paid experience type thing, and so uh, we do see that um, just being um, covered under the game and fish side, actually. But mm -hmm. as Steph said, if that was going to be donated for some type of cause, um, then that wild game would have to be, um, it would have to be processed under state or federal inspection. Or it could be processed if it was being donated, it could be processed at a customer wild game plant as long as it is stamped donated before it leaves the plant. So the other caveat or other thing to, I guess, clarify it a little bit of, of why that, that question made me think so much is if a, if farm raised wild game, domestic wild game is being harvested, say by the individual to go to a commercial facility, then it would have to be in, processed at a state inspected or federally inspected plant that did wild game. 
So, so a few different caveats to that question. Thank you. Um, do we have to wash eggs before selling them? If you are selling them as Wyoming ungraded eggs, no, you do not. If you are selling them as under chapter 15 of the Wyoming Food Safety Rule as a licensed graded facility or as a inspected graded facility, then yes, they would have to be washed. Can you speak a little bit about non-hazardous versus potentially hazardous foods under the Food Freedom Act and the general okay. differences in the rules that apply to these classifications? This is a question I get almost every single time that I present on the Wyoming Food Freedom Act, almost every time. Um, so the Wyoming Food Freedom Act differs a little bit in what um, they consider a non-potentially hazardous food or what the act considers a non-potentially hazardous food as compared to what the Wyoming Food Safety Rule does in our licensed facilities. Um, so anytime that you are talking food freedom, the, the definition of a non-potentially hazardous food is actually what's specifically outlined. So if you go into the um, Food Freedom Act, it defines a non-potentially hazardous food means a food that does not require time and temperature control for safety, including limiting pathogenic microorganism growth or toxin formation. Non-potentially hazardous food includes, but is not limited to, jams, uncut fruits and vegetables, pickled vegetables, hard candies, fudge, not mi nut mixes, granola, dry soup mixes, excluding meat-based soup mixes, coffee beans, popcorn, and baked goods that do not include dairy or meat frosting or filling or other potentially hazardous frosting or filling. So essentially looking at that, it's really foods that do not require time and temperature for control. So it's essentially foods that are not refrigerated would be your non-potentially hazardous foods. And then um, when it when you're talking, the de it also gives a definition of potentially hazardous foods and goes on to say that it includes, but is not limited to foods requiring refrigeration, dairy products, quiches, pizzas, frozen doughs, meat and cooked vegetables and beans. So really when you're thinking about it, one requires refrigeration, one doesn't is kind of the simple answer. Thank you. Yep. Does the 1,000 head rule apply to all poultry, including duck, turkey, and domestic quail? It does actually require apply to all poultry products. It's not just chicken, it's any poultry product. For future questions, what is the best route to get those answered? Um, so as far as through our department, any of your local inspectors can answer questions. Um, I've also put my number on here um, on this presentation, and I, I'm more than willing to take any questions that you may have. Um, also, our main office can answer questions, and that number is 307 777-7211. Um, I also believe that the Food Coalition has a um, question and answer network. I can't remember the exact name of what you guys are, are calling it, um, but has, and many of those questions, um, I, I think that we're, we're working much closer recently of, of trying to get some consistency in the answers that are being given. Um, and so I know that Ashley and I have been working with the, the Food Coalition, and I see that Jennifer jumped on and with Jennifer um, to try to get better answers to some of those, those questions and make sure that the message is consistent. We do have a page on our website that's specifically dedicated to asking questions about the Food Freedom Act or food safety. And we have an option to remain anonymous for people who may be worried about that. So that's on our website for anyone who comes up with questions after the fact and may not want to call the Department of Ag directly. Um, I see that Jen has her hand up. 
Thank you. And thanks so much um, for speaking tonight. We really appreciate this. Um, as a follow up to my last question, um, could you just outline as far as the differentiation between the hazardous and non sort of what that results in for those different food products? Um, and I know this is kind of vague because I haven't reviewed this category recently, but I just remember being a little bit confused as to um, kind of what throws something in one direction or another, if it's hazardous or non, what are the ramifications for a hazardous versus non under the Food Freedom Act, please? So the biggest difference, um, anytime that you're talking potentially hazardous or non potentially hazardous foods, um, and the biggest difference between them is your potentially hazardous foods naturally carry, the food inherently carries a larger bacterial load. So it's a more risky food. And that is, that's really the biggest difference between a potentially hazardous and a non-potentially hazardous food. Did that answer your question, Jen? Um, I feel like I need to do more homework to better ask my question. I'm just curious, um, for instance, if I'm a market, and I'm so, I'm a consignment market and I have vendors and I want to sell as their designated agent, both hazardous and non-hazardous products. Obviously, there's just certain things that are going to be inherent with that. Like you are going to be refrigerating things that are temperature sensitive. But as far as a regulation standpoint, do you go in to looking at those things Um in a different light? And are there constraints, I guess, on the markets between those two different groups of foods, other than just the obvious measures that they need, you know, for instance, with milk to refrigerate it? But are there other things that um, by having those two different categories as a consignment market, you would need to be aware of? Um, anytime that we're looking at non-potentially hazardous versus potentially hazardous based on the Food Freedom Act, we go back to the definition that's specifically stated in the Food Freedom Act. So depending, we would then look at which of those categories that it falls under. Um, the biggest difference between what can and can't be done with the two products is how it can be sold. So a potentially hazardous product may only be sold by the producer to the end consumer or by a designated agent to the end consumer. Whereas the non-potentially hazardous can be sold at retail or grocery. So uh, that, as well as the others. The and so that's that's the biggest difference between the two products is how they can be sold. Okay. That's what I was after. Thank you so much. And that's Jen, if you're looking for it, um I don't remember exactly where that is. I believe that it's in the statute, it's 1149-103-C. Got it. I'll definitely remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and we can chat later about it if you need it again. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Those are all the questions I have in the chat here. Does anyone else have anything they want to put in the chat or unmute and ask directly. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and thanks so much to Stephanie and to Ashley as well. Um, we really appreciate you coming and answering all our questions and being so helpful with this topic because we know you probably get bombarded quite often with a lot of the same questions. But we um, appreciate you having us on tonight. And like I mentioned, if there's any other questions after this, um, my contact information is on the screen or feel free to call the Department of Ag. And we also have that page on our website that you can submit questions through as well. So thank you everyone for coming and this recording will be up sometime in the coming week. Thank you. Thanks everyone.